Yes, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Oro Tunodad. I'm so excited and really, really honored to be your program director for this evening's events. As you know, we are right at the end of Women's Month. And of course, what would Women's Month be without conversations with impactful women as we seek to change the reality of women in the country and, of course, globally? Uh, today is no different. Uh, we the BMF Women Empowerment Desk has brought together a real powerhouse of a woman to come and share in a panel discussion with all of you this evening. It's good to see that ladies came out and there are some gents here. If we could all please rise for the Honorable Dr. Pumzini Lambunguga and the rest of our VIP desk. Thank you very much. You may all be seated. All right, it won't be my job today to welcome you all, even though I've unofficially welcomed you to this evening for our conversation. I'd like to call up onto the stage Umis Mingi Makapela, who is the BMF chairperson in the Eastern Cape, to share uh, some words of welcome to all of you before we kick off this evening's program. Uh, Minky, I do not see you. Oh, there you are. Mampi, um, the deputy president of the BMF, um, the leadership of the BMF in the Western Cape under the stewardship of Ubudloiso, um, BMF members in good standing that are in the room, ladies and the few gents that we see, good evening. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure um, to have all of you here this evening um, to celebrate um, this women in this women's month and this is really a celebration um, that's aimed at highlighting um, the empowerment of women as key to socio-economic transformation we know that women are the majority in the country yet we still occupy less positions in in, in leadership roles it is befitting then that this evening we have mom Pumzile to close off the month for us um, we all know what a powerhouse she is and we can't wait um, to hear her in conversation with the deputy president as she shares you know how she has made it there and give us the younger generation um, tips on, on 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 navigating the road um, in leadership ladies and gentlemen with those few words um, let me welcome all of you here this evening. Um, take off your jackets um, and really let's drink from this fountain um, that is Umamu Pumzile this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minki. Uh, what a beautiful welcome and so true. We are here to really grow and drink from this fountain of knowledge that we have with us today. What an incredible privilege it is to be in this room amongst all of you. Um, we also have a, a fantastic sponsor that is partner with the BMF for Women Empowerment Desk for this year, and that is the Bidvest Group. We have they are their group commercial executive, or Miss Jackie Kumalo, who's here today. Jackie, could you please share a few words from the sponsor? Um, yes. It's so exciting to see an organization that has been a leader in service provision in South Africa since 1988. Uh, leaders in your field and really, really empowering to see your investment in women empowerment. We're so honored to have you. And, and thank you for qualifying that, um, that it, it, it's only a few words that I'll be saying. <laughs> wow, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jackie Kumalo, as introduced uh, by the lovely lady. I started my journey at Bedvest 14 months ago. And in that time, I have truly experienced firsthand how women are agents of change. And that is because about halfway through my short journey, I was asked to be part of driving transformation in the group. Now, some might say that it says a lot about me, but I truly believe that it says a lot about Bidvest and the leadership's focus on women's empowerment. 
I won't be rattling any stats around what Bitwaste has achieved from a women empowerment point of view. But for me, I think it's important to just share just how as Bitwaste we could not have found a better partner in the Black Management Forum, and especially with SA2 and her team. It really has been truly amazing to think that we first had our meeting about five months ago. And yet already we've had three events uh, in that very short period. Now, today's event, I think as already mentioned, is especially iconic because not only will we get to engage amongst ourselves about how women can be change agents, but because we also have a real opportunity to gain special insights from our beloved Mrs. Pumzilem Lambunuk. Now, I don't need to tell you why it is important that we empower women and why as women, we must be the agents of change. But I can, however, say that it simply must be done. I don't think we have a choice. Each and every one of you in your current role, in your organization, in your community, and in every project that you get involved in, you simply have to do it. That is our race to run and to eventually win. If not for any reason, but to make a contribution and make things better for the next person, or better still, the next woman who steps into your position. I truly thank you for the opportunity that I've been given to speak, and I look forward to an inspiring and insightful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackie Kumada. Gorgeous shoes, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's really one of our superpowers as females to look fabulous while leading and changing lives. Um, such a privilege to have you partner with us this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, before we continue with the rest of the program, um, the BMF uh, team has put together a video. They were challenged to do a blog, take over a blog, and talk about some of the challenges that they face as female leaders in their organizations, uh, being small business owners and being, I don't know, the only black female in a boardroom sort of thing. Uh, they've put together this incredible video. Neville, can you please come up and help me to play it? So it's just a snippet that I think is going to give us an insight as to the conversation that we're going to have this evening, uh, where they're very candid in sharing their realities and obviously what they want to achieve uh, as trailblazing women that they are. Neville is the super Superstar behind the sound desk this evening, and he's going to help me play the video. I don't know what to do. Um, hi, BMF family. Um, my name is Esetu Mangotwa, BMF Deputy President. My name is Minty Akapela. I'm the Provincial Chairperson of the Black Management Forum in the Eastern Cape. My name is Farah Ali. I am the KZN Provincial Chairperson. My name is Lorato Mokai. I am the current Black Management Forum Young Professional um, Head of Enterprise Development. Courage to write um, an article as women to talk about the challenges that we may face or we have come across um, in our development process um, in terms of being a leader. Which really aims for BMF women to share experiences about how it is to be um, women, you know, in the workplace, at times you are the only person sitting around the boardroom table um, and how really women are managing to balance all the parts of their lives while climbing the corporate ladder and facing the challenges um, linked with that. In spite of evidence shown by some of the top 100 corporates in giving women their rightful position in leadership, majority of companies and society at large still see women as second to men. In my personal experience, both in business world and career, I've lived to experience discrimination. It's common 
but not right that as a woman i have to work 10 times more than my male counterparts promoting and developing my business and sometimes this comes at the back of men seeing me as a target than a possible businesswoman you know you get this um executive appointment you're very excited maybe you're a bit smug because you know you're the only female and the first female to get onto the executive management team um in a team of mainly males um and then once all the celebrations are over uh the reality starts to hit that because you're the only female in the boardroom you're likely to be the only person who's watching your phone for phone calls from home or phone calls from school um which you actually have to take because i firmly believe that um your 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 your, your well-being including the well-being of your family is is absolutely paramount and i don't compromise that for anything so i've got two little daughters who um i drop off at school every morning and every now and then i get a call from school and i know it's either they've forgotten something at home uh or whatever it is but i need to take the call um regardless of what i'm doing um but then also um the decision that one has to make about whether to um drop everything and rush to school to drop off your little 10 year old swimming kit or to teach the little lady a lesson of responsibility and not to do that but um just highlighting some of the challenges that are unique to women that we have to um juggle and go through um in these positions even whilst you are the only one um uh sitting in in that boardroom um and also the fact that i have literally in the almost 9 10 months that i've worked at Grinica um i've never experienced a guy saying i've got to take this call um it's school it could be one of my kids the fact that women are able to cope on both fronts being a mother and a leader as extra motivation as leadership knows no gender boundaries therefore women and girls are africa's greatest untapped resource the quote i used for the quote i used in my article is from the first lady of namibia and it reads that open quote one thing we see is a very subtle pushback on women empowerment from men it's possible because of the way the issue has been shaped that in order for women to be empowered men have to be disempowered that's the misunderstanding it's a fundamental misunderstanding and that's why my approach is not from an angle of women leadership it's more from a perspective of inclusivity you cannot exclude half your population or or a significant part of that half and expect to perform at full capacity you cannot exclude half of your brains half of your talent half of your friends it doesn't make sense and you have to rectify it close quote society perceives men as better leaders than women in different aspects despite the notable similarities in the execution of assigned duties in essence both men and women have the capacity to implement change and lead in various levels in an organization to attain set goals and objectives to secure an equal future there's a need to change existing systems get rid of cultural stereotypes and most importantly women have got to trust themselves and each other there's an overarching need for women to start liberating themselves this is as much as the time for men to realize that they are no better than women and must be willing to give up space to women it is only then that a gender balanced leadership will be achieved in as much as it is important to see women in leadership it's also important to create a culture that is more accepting of women being in leadership that's why campaigns like the 2020 women on boards and women on board pledge for europe have stood up in raising the need to have more women participation in boardrooms these are part of the efforts to ensure that women occupy and maintain positions of power especially african women so it is not only the responsibility of male leaders i feel like we also have a responsibility as women to also encourage if not embrace this culture of support of women in certain structures as women we are constantly making decisions and sometimes these decisions will mean going against the status quo and this will definitely make some people very uncomfortable there will be silent judgment that could force us into second guessing some of those decisions and then you start comparing your trajectory to others 
but it is extremely important that we carve out ways to find, determine and define our own version of happiness and success. We may experience burnout by the personas we create that were allegedly going to help us achieve our own measure of success. The problem with these personas is that they contribute to suppressing your inner self, suppressing the core of you, suppressing the best parts of you, the parts that grant you permission to be your most authentic self. We often buy too much into what others think of who we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to be doing. That you need to put on that brave face and show up every day and show up as your best self. But know that if some days you don't show up, that is fine too. Take the time out to practice self-care. That is your right. Be patient with yourself on your journey. Embrace and enjoy every single step, every moment of success that surrounds you. And always remember, you are enough as you are. All right, can we give these incredible women leaders a big round of applause? I love how Loretta speaks so frankly. You know, there's a punch to everything that she's saying. We're not just ticking a box when we're making effective change, you know. Uh, we really have to be meaningful and intentional about the impact we want that change to be. Which brings us to why we are here today. There's a beautiful setup here. We're going to have a fireside chat and conversation uh, led by our Deputy President, Uese Tumangoya. And she's going to be talking to the Honorable Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nguga. And I know the word honorable is thrown around a lot within parliamentary debate and whatever it is. But I think today it is uh, rightfully placed a woman that is of esteem, integrity, uh, and moral ethic. We are so honored to have her. I'm going to do an intro of both her and Esetu as I invite them to the stage. Esetu, I'll start with you. Esetu is our deputy president at the BMF, as you know. Uh, she is a CA, SA, who holds an MBA from the Gordon Institute of Business, uh, Business Science. She's a seasoned financial professional with over 10 years experience in investment banking and private equity. She started her career at Standard Bank and then moved on to Patisa Pri Private Fund Equity and then went on to work at the Land Bank of South Africa. She's now a CFO, superstar achiever, who really manages the role of being in, in the boardroom, being a mom, uh, being a partner, a daughter, and Lisa, such esteem, esteem, um, grace, and kindness. We are so honored to have you lead this chat with us. A big welcome to Ese Tumangoja. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. And of course, she'll be chatting to another deputy president, the Honorable <laughs> Dr. Pumzile Mlambunguga, obtained her bachelor's degree in social science and education from the National University of Lesotho in 1980, as well as a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Cape Town in 2003. Uh, she worked uh, she then completed her doctorate in the University of Warwick. The work covered in her do doctorate was using mobile technologies to support teacher development in resource poor nations. She was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University in 2014. Dr. Mlambunguga was a member of the first South African parliament in 1994, first as deputy minister in the Department of Trade and Industry, and then as minister of minerals and energy. She later became the deputy president of our esteemed nation, being the highest ranking female political leader in the history of our country. Throughout her career, Dr. Mlambo Nguga directed her energy towards issues of human rights, equality, and social justice, with a specific emphasis on gender and youth development. She has a track record of giving back to her community, dating back to the pre-1994 years when she was a teacher and a lecturer. Dr. Mlambo Nguga was appointed as the United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of the UN Women in 2013 as the head of the United Nations entity that is dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. She was a global advocate for women and girls. She led the organization's initiatives, uh, innovative work in transforming social inequalities and discriminatory norms with initiatives such as He For Her, 
he he for she movement, including uh, the driving of men and boys being involved in the conversation on gender equality, the Unstereotype Alliance Initiative, which was influencing advertising norms for positive change and equal representation. This has helped countries change hundreds of laws and, and uh, that dealt with discrimination against women and girls. She has successfully mobilized a historic 40 billion, okay, 40 billion US dollars in financial commitments from member states. That's crazy. 40 billion US dollars in financial commitments from member states, private sectors, philanthropies, civil societies, as well as young people, which have formed the general generational equality to drive transformative change for women and girls around the world. Uh, she most recently was appointed as the new chancellor for the University of Johannesburg. She'll start her tenure in uh, October of this year. Uh, she was awarded the Cannes Lions Heart Award in 2019 for her work in the UA Women and Unstereotypes Alliance. Uh, she left the UN in August of 2021 after serving two incredible terms. She's also the recipient of the Forbes Woman of Africa Lifetime Achievement Award in 2022. I need to take a breath while we stand up. <laughs> and give a very, very warm welcome to this incredible, incredible pillar of leadership. Thank you so much, Rob. All right, there is a mic right next to you. Uh, do we need two? Yeah. Neville, can I please have another mic? All right, so both mics are on, ladies. Um, <laughs> DP, you will lead the discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will allow for a Q&A session, obviously, after the DP has had an interaction with Dr. Mlambo Ngoga. Uh, please take notes where you can. I feel like this is always an incredible teaching moment, and now you are learning from the very best, a global leader who's changed the world. Over to you, DP. Thank you very much, Is Okay, yes, the mic is on. Um, thank you, Oletu, um, for my one-minute uh, introduction, followed by <laughs> Mampumzile's 15-minute <laughs> introduction. <laughs> um, but, 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 but the part that I loved was she, she says, another DP. So at least on, the, on this deputy president level, I can, you know, I, we can go pound for pound, no ma'am. <laughs> um, Thank you um, to our guests um, of the BMF and in particular of the BMF's Women Empowerment Desk. Um, it is, it's amazing to see you all here this evening and I hope that um, we're going to have fun, we're going to have an enriching conversation and I hope that when we open for Q&A, you'll really take this opportunity to engage with um, this powerhouse um, who is also an aunt of mine, um, for disclosure, <laughs> for full disclosure. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, she, she, she's just amazing. And for me to sit on a stage with Mam Pumzile is, is absolutely a dream come true. Mam Pumzile, I'm going to jump right in and say that um, in one of your exit interviews, I think you were doing it with, um, oh, his name completely just escaped my Sherwin Bryce Pease. Um, as, as you were about to finish your term at UN Women, you mentioned how during your tenure, there was a focus on changing laws in the member states. I think you changed about 700 laws and 35 constitutions. Um, but then you mentioned something quite potent, and that is that not only the laws must be changed, but the societal norms. Because societal norms can be very stubborn regardless of changed laws. Um, it's like that thing where, isn't it closer, they would say, uh, or, you know, the way we do things tends to be quite stubborn um, regardless of the new rules or the new laws or the new, you know. Um, and you know, when I look at countries like your Pakistan, Central African Republic, Somalia, DRC, South Sudan, in countries where they really still have quite highly regressive societal norms against women, how did you go about not just on the 
level of the laws and the constitutions, but trying to, 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 to shift those societal norms um, as you laid down those laws um, to ensure that there was actual tangible change for the women um, in those countries and in those communities? Well, um, firstly, thank you for having me. And uh, good evening to everybody. It's, it's wonderful to end uh, the Women's Month with you. Um, thank you to Bidvest for the support of this occasion. And of course, uh, to the BMF uh, Women's Desk for pulling such a wonderful show. Really uh, appreciate it. Also disclosure, not only is she my child, but Jackie uh, at Bedvest, one of my children is there. So <laughs> disclosure everywhere. <laughs> uh, you know, let me start by saying, we know sex uh, is what we are biologically. You are a boy because um, you will have beard, you have your private parts that look different from that of a girl, your voice change, etc. You are a girl because you'll grow breasts and so on. So this is how you are uh, going to develop. And this is how you are shaped. But gender, is something that you learn. It is a, a, a societal shaping of you as a human being. So it can be changed at any time of your life. There may be a time when you may believe and do certain things because of how you've been socialized. But actually, if you are accompanied in a particular direction, you can change that but it is so difficult. These are the norms that are so difficult. And uh, to try and change the norms in society um, takes a lot of investment and, times, and time. We recognize that uh, in the many countries where we changed laws, we had least success in countries where there was religious authority where there was a traditional uh, authority because of how heavy um, that, that, that is. And I think uh, in trying to do that, we had to find the stakeholders in society in, who influence uh, those who entrench these, uh, these, these norms. For instance, we formed uh, an all-African organization of traditional leaders. And right now I have to go and, re and recruit Mrs. Zulu to join. <laughs> <laughs> so that they can actually set the tone in their communities. In particular, we wanted them to focus on gender-based violence, on ending early marriage and keeping the children um, at school as well as ending f female genital mm. mutilation. The thing about that is that many of the traditional leaders actually also do not believe in enforcing these archaic behaviors. So it was wonderful for us to work with them and then to sit back in community meetings and listen to them telling their people why they should not have this behavior. In Zambia, for instance, in some parts of the country, they would find a goat. They know you have to pay, give a goat or a chicken for if your child is not going to school. Uh, if your child in, in Malawi, if your child marries early, uh, you have to face your chief. And there they had a chief who was a woman. She was really strict and um, you could go to jail if your child marries early. So it's, you can bring about these changes, but it takes a lot of time, but it's worth doing it, yeah. Wow, sure. Um, it's, I can't imagine a, 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 a woman 
chief in Malawi yeah. um, enforcing that, that that change in the society. But 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 if it can be done in in Malawi by a woman chief, it it means that it can be done. But as you say, you know, you need to identify the right change agents mm. within the communities um, and then work with them. Um, to, to, to assist. But maybe let me also highlight that in South Africa, we also have those problems. Mm. Because sometimes when we talk about these problems, it looks like we think that these happen, this elsewhere. happens elsewhere. We have Gutwala, uh, which is something that uh, needs us to fight. We have Ugutlolwa, something that is um, um, unacceptable. And all of that is made possible by the traditional leaders and, of course, patriarchy. But, you know, these are the challenges we still have in South Africa. 100%. I, I'd actually written, I didn't ask it in your question, but I said in SA we have our own pockets of mm. highly regressive societies mm. against women. So you're 100%. Uh, Mampumzile, you also spoke about building alliances in the women emancipation agenda as part of one of the things that that made you quite effective in that role. And you mentioned that it can't only be up to government and civil society because the space is too narrow. We needed to significantly widen and deepen the support base. So my question to you is, at you, at you, in your time at the UN, which maybe group of people did you bring into this alliance that caused the biggest shift or step change in advancing this cause. A, 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 a group of people that previously was not part of the agenda who you brought in and with bringing them in, you saw the significant step change. Is it, is it men? Is it male leaders or the traditional leaders that you speak about? Which one was the most sort of impactful? Where you said, "Okay, you've been you've been outside of this agenda. We're now bringing you to the table," and and through that you saw a, quite a significant shift. Mm. Yeah. Well, first let me just uh, start by saying, uh, women of my generation, it's probably better in your generation. We thought that we're the only ones who can address this issue. And uh, engaging, uh, for instance, uh, uh, engaging men was like, yo, bona, <laughs> there is no way. But uh, we have had to move and push to look at how big the problem is. And also to start by saying, this is a male problem. This is not a woman's problem. Gender inequality is something that men foster. So they have to take the responsibility to bring about the change. And if you think of women in society, not all women are, are activists focused on uh, addressing gender uh, discrimination. Of the women you know who are concerned about the issue, only a an, handful are dedicated to it. Of those you know that are dedicated to it, even a smaller group has got the resources, the time, and the potential. It is a numbers game. So you have to continuously expand the number of people that will be in your corner. So it was clear to me that this thing is not going to work. We just so few people. I looked around the world in every country. I could size up just the number of people I could rely on. And it was clear to me that not only were they few, they also did not have power. And therefore, that further marginalized them. I needed powerful people who can make the changes. I needed to guilt trip them um, <laughs> as, as well. But I also, we also needed to transform them because we can be as transformed as we want to be as women. If men are not transformed, we're still in trouble. Because if you just think of gender-based violence, only if men were to decide they would not beat up women could we take a, a breath, you know? 
only when men would say, I will not marry a child, would we say, yo, abandonabitu, they can grow up and enjoy being children. So you actually need these people you are against in your corner. You have to have strategic alliance with the people you are against in order uh, to, to create the change uh, that, you, that you want. So definitely men were a priority for me as you and women. And it, it was quite hard to convince uh, women uh, within UN Women that this thing is not for you. You are helping them uh, to sort out their mess. And we also, have, we also have to make sure that when we are challenging men and they come on board and they do the work, uh, we must not put them on a pedestal because you shouldn't praise the fishes, the fish for swimming. They are just doing their job. Um, we also wanted, obviously, men with authority. So in our he for she movement, which we created for men who stand for gender equality, we focused on heads of states because if there is so much discrimination in the world. And of course, most countries are ruled uh, 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 by men. So many men, therefore, have power and in, in, in authority. It means that we've got bad men. I mean, seriously bad guys. <laughs> so it's important to find amongst them a few that will work with us to change the rest. I focused on heads of universities because of the discrimination that we see in universities and the gender-based violence um, in, in universities, and then heads of corporations. And for each uh, uh, man who became part of the he for she uh, team, team leader, you had to commit. What is, it, uh, that you, what is it that you're going to change in your institution? Interesting enough, uh, one of the auditing firms decided that they were going to do equal pay. Now, if you think that the Convention on Equal Pay was signed in 1912 at ILO, look at where we are. We still, so far, they did it in three years. In three years, they got all their stuff to be men and women uh, paid paid the same for work of equal value. What some of the companies, a lot of them focused on, on, on uh, violence against women. Most of them did not have in-house policies on violence against women. Uh, there was no way where women could report. Uh, there was no compensation, etc. They established the policy which actually made sure that women must know that they are welcome to come and talk about their experience in the, in, in the workplace. So the expansion of men and bringing men in, the expansion that brought the men in made, uh, made the difference. The expansion of bringing private sector in also made sure that we can address some of the e economic challenges that we still face. But that being said, we still have a long way to go. It is terribly slow. And it is also challenging that um, the, the, the women who we need so much to be in those positions are still so few. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so th there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of work to do, but um, I think in your two terms at UN Women, you have left them thinking, you, this South African lady that came here and just shifted <laughs> things around. So I think you did a phenomenal job whilst acknowledging that there's still um, a, a way to go, Mampumzi. You know, <clears throat> you mentioned something at the beginning of the answer to this question. You, you said you, you need people but you also need people who've got 
I think you, you, the way you put it was, if you look at the women, um, there are few, but if you look at the women who've got the power and the resources, well, I suppose either women or men, that's even fewer, mm. and you need people with mm. influence. Mm. Now, it actually dovetails so nicely into my next question, because <clears throat> I attended a women's breakfast about a week ago, um, hosted by Duke Corporate Education and African Women Chartered Accountants. And <clears throat> speaker after speaker, you know, spoke about my struggle in corporate, how I've navigated male-dominated environments, glass ceilings, how, or, or at least asking other women to support them in navigating um, glass ceilings, um, male-dominated environments, how other women had mentored and sponsored them. And, and, and <clears throat> it was all very inspiring. But I was sitting next to Uusis Swazi Lamini. And towards the end of the breakfast, she stood up and said something which struck me and stuck in my mind. And, and I'll get to the linkage to what you said. She said that as women, we ought to be careful of being very self-obsessed and self-focused um, and forgetting about the greater societal challenges. For example, in South Africa, we're facing low or non-existent economic growth. We're facing unemployment. We're facing the rising cost of living. We had strikes just the other day, and we're facing shocking levels of gender-based violence. And I think what she meant was that we've had three, four hours in this room as women, and we haven't spoken about that. It's been about myself and corporate ladder and how to navigate the men, etc. But a question that struck me, and I want to pose it to you, is how do we as women, because that, that rising in corporate or in your own business or in politics gives you the power and the influence and the resources to make a change. How do we, and 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 and, uh, Oloetu did say I did an MBA, right? So let, I'm gonna bring out some MBA lingo here. It's called <laughs> ambidexterity. Mm. Ne, ne, ne gives, <laughs> gives fees. <laughs> How do we balance the two because we are trying to empower ourselves, not all of us, but some of us are trying to empower ourselves because we know that it is with that power that we can actually influence and make a difference. But now you, there's this part that says, but guys, don't be selfish, don't be too self-focused, what about the great? So how do you, how do you balance those two mm. sort of um, 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 imperatives? Yeah, well, let's just start by saying that a, a true feminist uh, is not focused on herself and just on women. A true feminist thinks about all the minorities and the people uh, whose rights are not respected in society. So you can be a true feminist and be homophobic. You can be a true feminist and be ageist, a, a true feminist and racist you are constantly thinking about all of these issues in society. You can't be a feminist and be a climate denialist. So the good thing about uh, thinking broadly about women uh, is the ability to bring into the fold all of the issues that impact the society you live in and work for. So that as you fight for gender equality, you are also fighting to address all these other issues. Because in any case, it is these connected issues that contribute towards the oppression of women. Uh, people who uh, focus only uh, on, on women tend not to understand fully how much we are not building a women's colony. We're building a healthy society where men and women should be able to thrive. We're not interested in impressing men, so don't panic, guys. 
<laughs> we are not intending to, to oppress men. We are also interested in your own liberation. It is actually a concern to us that so many boy children commit suicide. Uh, and the pressure that they feel, which has nothing, they've, they've got nothing to do with them. They haven't not done anything, but society has put this uh, pressure on them. So I would say, as you empower yourself, it, you'll always have to think about all these issues and, and bring them up. And, and by the way, the issue of empowerment of women uh, also has got to have an, a, a point at which you have had enough you will be empowered to the point that you can say, I have, I have been empowered. I don't have to be constantly fighting about something that must benefit me. I am now concerned about how do I create conditions for more people to benefit? Because what's the point of having a handful of women, which is what will happen if you just focus here in this room, just focusing on ourselves, we can be so over empowered and leave everybody out. You know, what's that? So you have to, you know, to be all over. Um, Mama, I want to move to the, the, the subject of policies. And, and and I think you, 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 you'll be well-versed with this, whether it, with your time at the UN, but also with your time in government. And I wanna, there's actually two angles that I, I, I want to, to, to approach this from. You know, I was, once again, it's been a busy month, guys, I've been. <laughs> yeah, it's been. I was in Klexdorf, <laughs> I think a week or two ago, at another BMF women's <laughs> event. And um, there was an MEC of agriculture who was speaking about the fact that something along the lines of the fact that, you know, at certain levels of government, so maybe the, the president and the ministers may, 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 may have a policy that says, I think, it's, I think it was 40% of procurement. Does anybody know what the actual number is that must go to women? Is it 30? 30. 30% of all procurement, of all government procurement must go to women. And she was kind of highlighting the challenge of saying, how, sometimes you may be sitting as an MEC really believing in that policy, but then at the operational level where this must actually take root, mm -hmm. you find that the civil servants there for whatever reason, because maybe they're thinking, ah, if I'm gonna give Minty this this tender, what you know, maybe there's a competition. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you then have that filter down? Because we're always speaking about we've got the best policies, we've got the best policies, we've got the best policies, implementation is a problem. And for the first time in that session, I thought maybe one of the challenges of implementation is what this MEC is bringing mm -hmm. about, that there may be this disconnect between and I don't know the government levels very well, but president, minister, DG, MEC, but then at the, at, the, at the level, let's say at the municipal level, you find that there, they don't actually really want to implement this, 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 this policy. How, how do you bridge that gap when it comes to a policy like um, um, women empowerment and, and, and let's make an example of this 30% procurement um, policy. Uh, you know, um, gender discrimination is bad corporate governance. And you have to frame it like that uh, at the workplace. Uh, you have to make sure that it is compulsory for everybody. Uh, men who work for government must know that they are managing public resources and they have a responsibility to share these resources uh, with everyone in society, men and women. And we, if you are the leader, you have to put measures to make sure that that happens and there must be consequences when that doesn't happen. Leaders must lead, really. 
they cannot waste power. If you've got power, don't be, use it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I remember uh, uh, when I was at, at Department of Minerals and Energy and doing a transformation in the mining sector. It was hard. But I, and I did not even manage to do everything that I wanted to do. In fact, one of the most frustrating thing was to be taken out of, of DME to become deputy president because I just felt, my goodness, what is this now? <laughs> you know, this work is not done. And you know that when you change, uh, you create instability and then you slow down and, you know, but the, the, the real thing there was that my team knew that I will not tolerate anyone who does not do what I've said must happen. And, and as you know, in a department like uh, 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 DME, you have a lot of matodas. Yeah. <laughs> and they can take their chances. And you really have to push. So yes, I know that, as the MEC was saying, that sometimes there is passive and real resistance uh, at that uh, middle level. But you've got to go there and crack the whip. I really am not going to cut any slack for leaders. Leaders have to lead. That paycheck that you get at the end of the month, you get it because you are supposed to be doing the work. There is just no other way. I feel like when you have power, you must use it. <laughs> or lose it. Or lose it. You must make sure. <laughs> <laughs> you sounded there like you were quoting our esteemed BMF president, Andy Lenomlala, who, was all, <laughs> who often tells us the same thing. <laughs> um, my, you know, you made, you made a statement um, in one of the, I, I don't know how many interviews of yours I've watched. Mm. So, <laughs> you, you, and, and this is about, let me take a step back. I think there was an interview where somebody asked you, is it not maybe backwards and regressive to have policy, to have laws specifically for women? Why aren't laws just for, for everybody? Why do we need laws specifically for women? Is that not, you know, something of the past? And I remember you said, laws cannot make a racist or sexist to discriminate against you, but laws prevent them from doing so with impunity. Yeah. And that for me was, 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 it, it just stuck in my mind. Um, in a South African context, how do we, number one, enforce? I, I, I think you've partly answered it mm. through, lead, through leadership and leadership actually leading and using their power to enforce. But w what also can be done uh, or sort of punitive measures for those who, let's say corporates or, or whichever, even in municipalities, for those who simply refuse what what can be done to 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 as a punitive measure mm -hmm. to 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 actually enforce those laws i mean you see that also when you look at things like bee and and transformation some corporates really couldn't be bothered mm -hmm. what really can be done in those kinds of instances yeah. well firstly let me just say uh, of course there's a difference between equality and equity um so if we are to talk about being um, equal, we must look at where everyone is standing. And if I, I am sitting here, you and I are sitting here, and maybe if we could be the same height, even though I think you've moved very high, <laughs> and there's someone who's the same height as ours who's standing there, and I'm saying that me, us, and that person, we are equal. We are not. Mm. We have to create conditions for this person to come to the same level and then think then about how we we address the issue so there's going to be more to give to this person so that they can uh, reach the same uh, level as us so the point i want to make is that we must always push back against anyone who tells us that we must not have special measures for women for black people, for young people, whatever group,
that needs uh, to be to to be addressed. And again, we need to have policies that speak to the goals we want to achieve, so that the people that want to dismiss what is supposed to be the, the order knows that know that this is the policy I am breaking. And the policy must also say, what are the consequences of not uh, doing what is right by the policy? I really think that when we have policies, they must have teeth. Don't give me policies in a scene. <laughs> policies must have must have teeth so that is a luma. Otherwise, people will not take the policies serious, especially in these areas that are sensitive, where there is inherent resistance. Yeah. Now I'm going to move to a touchy subject, uh, ladies. And this is the subject that I, I grapple with myself. And I, I've always said to myself, I refuse to accept this as, as, as a given. This thing that says, as women, we don't support each other. We, in Sebenzini, you know, uh, this woman will just not like you, Jay, for some, some reason. You don't know why. And, 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 and we'll almost go out of their way to make you feel either inferior or incapable, or if they are your direct line manager, to, to, to make you feel, what actually, you know, you report to me and I'm your boss. And, you know, so they, they, they really enforce this power dynamic. And there's a, there, there's a general consensus that I refuse to accept as a general consensus, by the way, I always say, it's pockets, it's one person. If one person oppresses you in your corporate life, I never want to say all women. But there is this thing, Yoguti women generally, Tina Asi Sapotani, the way men do. Um, we, 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 we kind of have this thing against each other. What I want to ask you, Umam Pumzile, is with your very vast experience, have you picked up any kind of trend or, or, or something maybe subconscious and subliminal in your discussions with, I mean, you must have had discussions with women all over the world that could point to why this happens, even if it happens sporadically, but even if it happens sporadically, it's almost one too many. Why does it happen? Uh, so, so, so number one, I refuse to believe it's a general thing that women hate each other and will never support each other. But it does happen because it keeps coming up. Have you picked up any sense of what is it about those women who do those things? What makes them do that? Is it a sense of feeling threatened? Is it a sense of I finally made it to the C-suite and therefore uh, I, I, I've got to protect my space? Is it even, in my own reflections, I've asked myself, is it even this imposter syndrome where maybe as women we're there, but we don't really believe we deserve to be there. So, so we don't want any other women to come and see that you actually don't really deserve to be there. Have you picked up any trends, Mama, in, 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 in why is it that this occurs, um, even if it's not a general thing, but it definitely does occur? In those instances, what is it inside maybe that, that, that particular woman that, is, that, that makes them behave in that way? Well, it is je definitely not a general thing. And I will also say, why do men and women sometimes behave like that? Because this is not a subject that is just for women. Otherwise, if we put it like that, we risk uh, giving credibility the belief that women are the ones who are guilty of doing this. They're just people who are like that. And some of them happen to be women. Uh, but to the extent that we are concerned, because we do not want to see uh, women um, in that uh, position, indeed, there are people who get into these senior positions uh, who do not feel they deserve to be there, 
who are afraid that other people who may be stronger than them, who may enter the room, will expose them, will take over, will lead better than them. So the one way to stay alone there is to have this uh, facade uh, that oppresses other people. Men, women, you know, they, 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 they would do that. And I think it is something that in our many engagements amongst ourselves, we must constantly call out. Because sometimes people also will not be aware that this is what they are doing. So we must constantly call out. And if they are doing it consciously, we will actually help them to reflect about uh, the impact of what they, they, they are doing. I have also seen that happening to younger women, where the presence of younger women in places that some women feel is for women who have arrived, uh, who have achieved A, B, C, D, and you are beginning to stay out of this. That too is discrimination. So whether it's discriminating other women who may be your equal but junior than you, uh, women who are junior than you because they are younger, it is all wrong. And also, you cannot also do that to men, by the way, who are junior than you. They too deserve your respect. So all around, uh, we have to be striving to create women who will represent us in the fairest and the best way possible. Thank you. Then I think the last question from me, and before I hand over to 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 Olet, I think you're going to facilitate. <laughs> okay, do that. Um, I think you mentioned Mampunzile in in one of <laughs> your interviews. Um, that one of the ways of empowering yourself as a woman, you said, be a member of something. Mm. Be a member of an organization, a yeah. group, a group. stock fair, a something. Yeah. Just be a member of something. Mm. Because through that, you know, you learn, you observe, you, you almost have a purpose greater than yourself. So for us here as BMF members, we've ticked that box. Mm. Um, and those of you who are not BMF members, Mam Pumzile has said, be a member of something. Mm. Guys, be a member of the BMF. <laughs> as simple as, it's as simple as that. Um, but I think maybe uh, the last question for me is, now that we are a member of, of this thing that we truly believe in and love called the BMF, and, and, and perhaps to be more specific as the Women's Empowerment Desk, what advice would you give us as we as young leaders look around this country right now when we say, okay, there's unemployment which disproportionately affects women, mm. there's gender-based violence, there's uh, this rising cost of living that's crazy, there's, 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 there's corruption that also disproportionately affects women, there's lack of access to funding. How, what would, where do we start? What, what do we focus on? Where, where, where can we be most impactful? I think if I can summarize and say, as the BMF Women's Empowerment Desk, where can we be most impactful given the context of our current state of our country? Yeah, um, I will emphasize that again, be a member of something. And be a part of a community group, be a, in a professional association, always find a place where you can make a contribution, learn and contribute yeah. uh, as well. Because your presence there also means that people will learn something from you. So it is uh, an, an enriching because when you are in that position where you are sharing what you may know better, you, you suddenly realize, okay, I am a member of society and I serve a purpose. 
Um, and it's, it's particularly true, by the way, um, when it comes to younger people, we have to start them young. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever, go and join and, and be something so that, so that they grow with this thing of knowing that it's important to be in a team because that also teaches you a lot about solidarity, about winning and losing gracefully and, and all of that. Uh, now that you have joined and you are part of this organization, which is in the economic space by and large, and we are in a country that has that is facing economic challenges, we need you to speak very loud about the challenges that you see, as well as the answers. Uh, because don't think that people who are in government have got the answers to all these problems that we have. They absolutely need to hear from you because in some cases you may understand it better because you live with it. You see it um, every day. So, I mean, I, I, I get excited when your president speaks and the way he doesn't mean <laughs> he is bam, 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 bam. We need that. And we need more of you to actually take that leaf and to uh, be as loud as you possibly can. But secondly, I think that to the extent that not everybody can feel that uh, they want to uh, stand up and be, and be on a pedestal, wherever you are, in the boardroom, never leave a meeting in the boardroom without speaking. Because if you sit there and you're quiet, you eradicate yourself. We will not remember that you are part of that community. Make sure that people know what you think, what you will accept, what you will not accept. But amongst yourselves, caucus, what are the things that you all want to say to the companies that you work for, that you lead, that you own, so that there is a voice that grows that is saying the same thing about some of the most critical issues that you, you are uh, most concerned about. If I just take an issue like uh, violence against women and sexual harassment at the, at the workplace, there has to be now in South Africa, really, a unified policy position that no company can exist even one day if they don't have because you have all said hell no. And to the extent that gender-based violence uh, is so, so much in South Africa, there is no way people will not believe that this is something that they have to listen to. So just, just one example, you need to find a way of using this space to caucus and then going out wherever you are and push. Thank you very much. Um, oh, wow, <laughs> that, that, that hand went up very fast. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming to you, Kulu. <laughs> there you go. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so much. Um, so I've written my question down here. Please forgive my nerves. Um, so it's always very refreshing to to, to listen to you speak, uh, Mama. I I reference your recording of you speaking to the BMF more than I probably should. Right? I always go back Louder. to it. Oh, sorry. I always go back to your recording of the last time that the BMF had you in 2020 more than I probably should. Uh, it's always very refresh, refreshing to, to to listen to you. But my question for for this evening is, um, I read somewhere that. Um, there's, there's just, uh, uh, I think they said that there's too many young women dropping out of school, right? And I always uh, interpret dropping out of school as you limiting your, your chances of being successful in life. So yeah, so you're just doomed for the rest of your life, right? 
And I, I never understand why in 2020 or 2021, we're gonna have stats of that nature, right? So my question is, so I come from a family where all the firstborns are women. Um, so I have a very, I have very little experience of patriarchy and male dominance in my family. I was brought up to aspire, I was not brought up to aspire to marriage, and that came from my grandfather because everybody in my family, the firstborns are all women. So nobody speaks over what we say, right? Um, um, so now what I'm trying to understand is how do I help a young girl in high school aspiring to work as a cashier because she believes that that's the best that she can do because she's in the most rural areas of the Eastern Cape um, to understand that there's more out there for her. I understand very well what she's exposed to and her experiences because she is me. That's where I was when I was her, right? And um, the only difference between who she is and who I am is that I'm an extreme introvert and I spend a lot of my time watching TV. And at one point in my life, I mentioned to somebody in my grade 10 class that I wanted to study abroad and they said that I'm dreaming. And then I was like, challenge accepted. What do you mean, right? So I've always just um, wanted to be more than anyone expected me to be only because of that, only because of that challenge at the one, that one specific time. But what bothers me the most is that whenever I go back home, um, the challenges that they face back where I am from um, is that they're sitting there and they're thinking that at no point can I earn more than the person that I choose to be with because where they are, the greatest thing that they want to do has become wives and mothers to people, right? And nothing beyond that. And I understand that because they don't think that there is anything beyond that because that is what they were raised to do. I'm just trying to understand how do I go about without looking like, um, I'm not trying to look like I, I know better than what they know or I'm better than them, but I still want to let them know that there's more to what you're aspiring to be right now. Thank you. Right. So how it's going to work is I'm going to take one question and allow Umama to respond and then move on to the next question. We're probably going to allow about 20 minutes of a Q&A. So Mama, add a few already yeah. a response okay. to that, please. Yeah. Um, you know, um, it's, it's very uh, important to lift as you climb, to be always concerned about uh, the other person in your community, in your family, uh, in, your, in your workplace, and stop and talk to them about who they could be. It's important to continuously remind people that where they start does not determine where they will end. And education, is probably the most reliable vehicle to get you out of your situation. In fact, I think for me, it's the best thing next to a, a, a silver bullet. When we talk gender equality, if we do not have education in that package, I don't believe we'll make the progress that you want to make. So hard as it may be, it's important that when you identify a person that you feel is maybe not where they should be and they could be elsewhere, that you actually engage with them. But of course, there's the issue of resources. People need resources, need the help. I think you then have a, a responsibility to look at where they could get help in terms of resources, scholarship, so that they can move forward. We should not be satisfied um, that uh, we can just encourage people to do something. We should be, pa part, be part and parcel of actually make, make the solution really develop and come alive so that the person that we want to help can take advantage of it. And this is your community that you can bring some of these problems to so that you can then uh, go back and see how you could rescue uh, that woman. Uh, 
Nkose Mama. I am Anati Majeke, and I am a woman who's uh, in the political space. Now, my question is, you had mentioned that you had to do and foster a lot of unlearning in order to curb especially the scourge that we have with gender-based violence. Now, coming especially from someone who comes from the Eastern Cape, with a very rural background, how do we adopt that philosophy here? Because you have, unfortunately, with a lot of our learned friends in the Twitter space, the Twitterati, you find a lot of bigotry. Even with our learned friends, you have attorneys, you have your CAs, who still foster a lot of that mentality, mentality and they're refusing to unlearn because they still see us as women as being lesser than them. We might occupy the same spaces, be in the same uh, tables as them, even be in higher positions than they are because I'm currently a chief whip, whereas I have men who are older than me or who are in lower positions than me who still look down on me, who still foster a lot of those very toxic mentalities. So how have you managed to be successful in that space? Because unfortunately in South Africa, the tide is turning, but unfortunately it's turning at a very, very slow, a very low pace because unfortunately we had an incident three years ago with Uyinene who was brutally murdered, and there's a march that's happening for her in East London tomorrow, where we're still seeing a lot of rampant gender-based violence, mm. especially um, in our rural communities and in the Eastern Cape, and with a lot of our learned communities, because there's this misconception that gender-based viol uh, gender violence sorry, happens with people who are in the lower income streams, who are the working class, who are not necessarily the professionals. But you'll find a lot, I don't want to, Okay, I don't want to mention any specific um, uh, professionals, but people who know better and who know how to play around the law, who are still fostering and still maintaining those spaces and still maintaining those toxic mentalities. How can we work against that as professionals? Of course. Especially because you're a politician. <laughs> I will throw that back to you. We really need to enforce the policies that discourage bigotry, that ensures that there is consequences. I'll keep on having this thing of consequences because perpetrators become serial perpetrators because they can. There is nothing that discourages them. And what is missing in South Africa is really that strong, focus on making sure that whenever somebody breaks the law, especially uh, uh, crimes against women, there is actually consequences. You know, there was a time when, uh, when somebody beats up, um, somebody beats up a man and maybe even kills uh, a man, it's murder. It's a crime. It's clear. I took this. When someone beats up a woman, it's a love thief. Mm. What's loving about beating up somebody? Mm. We actually have to demonstrate that the law treats men and women equally and do that with consistency. I, I, and I think it's going to, it's one area where it's, go, it's going to depend on us as women to push and force uh, for the right action uh, to happen. I, I also think that uh, we need to also um, make sure that perpetrators of violence um, against women do not get on easily in life. When you apply for a job and there is a, you have a, a, a criminal record, uh, of gender-based violence, mm. I'm sorry. Mm. Don't take, why bring a perpetrator into your workspace? Mm. When you are a, a perpetrator and you are, you are at work, your wife must feel empowered to come to the workplace and say, Yebe tuna, we and expect action from the boss. We need to make the workplace, because it's a structured place, uh, one of the refuge that the women can go to because right now women are running out of places to run to. And I think we should try and see 
uh, how we could make this, the places that we, we work in to be the safe space for women where we flush out perpetrators. Right, we have a question from the other side of the room. I'm trying to practice equality. So that side, uh, <laughs> your turn. Thank you. Molosis. Hi. <laughs> Mine is not a question, but um, a gratitude mm -hmm. to say to you, thank you very much, Ngozi. People always say when we fill this form and talk about underprivileged, I always say, I mean, I was never underprivileged because during our time we lived uh, in communities that were healthy, that were safe. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, sh a very short story. I'm always interested in what is intangible in life than the tangible. I wrote my trick, 1989. Visited Sispumzile's house with my aunt. Tina Ngokusa school of Akubuzuba, Ufunda Bani, Uzagwenza Ndon. I passed my trick, I applied at Pentec, UCT, I was not accepted. Usispumzile, uh, I told her, Wapali later. Sinyan, Ben Bakalela Pasmo Ban be technology tin. Wapalila Tam Sinyan Wai Palela Uput Nonde Pafo Echal Station Park Dabaleka literally taking the letter to Uput Nonde. Then he wrote a letter to Fika G a Pentec. I took the letter to Pentec. Two days later I was submitted yeah. at Pentec. And I, mean, I always say to youngsters, technology, but what they don't understand is, I don't know what's the right term, but I call it intergenerational wealth. Mm -hmm. Our parents used to have friends. And Abandu and Ababu will be friends. Yeah. And Tina, we nurtured those relationships I've never had a job or been in corporate since 2008. Mm. I do my thing with the, that wealth. Mm. I've never had money. I'm not interested in money. I'm just interested in doing what needs to be done. Mm. To BMF, I'm not a member. I think I'll be a member as from today. <laughs> <Where are the phones? laughs> my, my quest and my plea to professionals. Go to our charity begins at home. If we could go back to our streets, go back to our communities, and display and exhibit and use uh, the talents, the professions that we have, this country will be completely different. Before 94, they, they, there were no policies. But abantu babeng abantu, sasi ngeta na sasi pila songe. So that's what we need to do to acquire the change we need. Thank you so much. All right, so I know we have quite a few hands that are still going up. We do have time only for uh, two or maybe three more questions, depending how brief or long the next one is. Um, Dumelang. I see everybody is saying um, Dumelang. I'm not from Tlegstop, but yeah, Dumelang. Um, thank you, Mama, for gracing us with your presence. Um, you spoke right now about safe spaces. Um, what I have noticed a lot, because in some of the safe spaces at home, these things, are we press them down and they are a secret. And so what I have noted a lot as well in that in the institutions where we study, that is actually where we meet a lot of these issues. You are going into the space of education. How do you think those places of learning and development can actually foster the kind of community that we'd like to see? Because as you know, there are people that have spoken up that have not been able to complete their degrees because they have spoken up. 
there are people in the workplace that have been shone because they have spoken up. What are the teeth that we need in the institutions to ensure that those people, when they graduate and they become members of this economy, what do they need to be thinking about already at that point? Thank you. Uh, firstly, never lose your voice. Uh, because it's the one thing that is going to protect you and propel you. And there may be consequences for having a big mouth, but take it. It really is worth it all the time. It's also important to network with other people. That is why this thing of being part of something, so that when we have those hard times, you have other people uh, that you can lean on, that can take your cause, that can speak for you. But whatever happens, don't lose your voice. That is absolutely, absolutely important. But obviously, also be part of bodies that have the capacity to, to speak for you, to fight for you when you face challenges and difficulties. Wow, thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Mamu Um it, it, it feels like a rain of wisdom and it, 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 it rains beautifully. Um, I've had the privilege of convincing a corporate to sign up for the Women Empowerment Principles. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what they were signing up for. <laughs> What a beautiful framework. What a systemic reflection of why, how life should be. A life of inclusivity. And thank you to the UN for that. How do we take that in South Africa? Because I watch and look at with, with how many JSC listed companies mm. sign up for these mm. principles. And I almost feel like, um, I said we should, as the BMF, you know, be getting a lot of these corporates to sign up and take the plunge. It's not an easy one. Take the plunge and really do the work and challenge, challenge themselves. And I like the fact that you take your pace with them. Mm. But I almost feel like in South Africa, you, we need a nudge and maybe the BMF can be the, the nudge. And I'm sure you coming back <laughs> from the UN and being with us, you can say there's something beautiful mm. that can make us all beautiful in those principles. Mm. Thank you. Well, I, I would say it's important to speak to the business associations um, and bring the empowerment principles to them. These are principles that we developed uh, in the UN, and companies can, can sign up, and they can then follow the principles. They are not super hard principles, but you have got to work like you mean it in order uh, for us to see the, 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 the real change. And you can compare yourself, not just with South African companies, but with companies around the world, because uh, these principles are being implemented in 112 countries. And they come together uh, every year around um, in, in, in March during the, com the CSW uh, Commission on the Status of Women, and they exchange practice and impact of what has happened as a result of those uh, principles. So we have a UN Women office here in South Africa. They are very helpful. They will hold you by your hand as a company as you try to implement these principles. So this is something that uh, uh, BMF can, can support and encourage companies to sign up to. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. So I was nudged um, program director behind me. The lady says I'm a member, so I can't speak. I must give her an opportunity. So if you'd please allow me to ask half a question, I'll give her the mic to ask another question. <laughs> and then can, In the can spirit answer. of equality. <laughs> yes. So Ma, for me, um, maybe it's a personal one, but I'd like to find out what is the biggest leadership challenge that you say you would say you faced and how did you overcome it? And also, um, what advice would you give to a woman who feels overwhelmed by responsibilities? And I'm talking about myself here because you in BMF, you uh, wife, you a mother, you have your own business, you there's just so much going on all sometimes at the same time, and you feel so overwhelmed that you don't know if you're coming or going, you know. Um, so what advice, um, ad so I know that if you're a female and you're Af African, because <laughs> so that type of, uh, those type of dynamics that you deal with as an, as an African um, woman, how, how, how have you navigated that and how, what advice would you give to, to someone who feels the same? Okay. Thank you very much, my sister. I'll cut to the chase. Um, I'm starstruck. I've never seen you in person. <laughs> when you were sitting to me, I wanted to reach my hand and just touch you, but I won't go there. Um, I just want to say I'm an accountant by profession and I'm a chartered one. Uh, the reason why I say I want you to get the context of my question it has nothing to do with politics at all. I was never even an SRC member. But there's something that is said sometimes about us as women not taking uh, that seat in those boardrooms that sometimes it's not that the opportunity is not there, but sometimes it's that we're refusing to. Uh, so what I want to ask you today after such a beautiful speech is, um, Sister Esetu said, um, uh, we can't just make it personal about us. There's a lot of things I can ask you personally. But I just want to ask, because I see we have a burning situation as a country. What will it take for you to raise your hand? Uh, because in my view, that woman president thing is overdue. <laughs> so that's literally what I want to ask. Thank you. OK. Let's let let me start by answering uh, the question of kind of it's a work life balance, right? Um, and the challenges that we face as African uh, women. I went through that situation in my own life where I was everywhere, and you know when we are always tired and there is never a time to take a, a moment just to sit down catch your breath before you move to the next thing until i just said you know what i can't do this i'm going to have to choose and as far as family is concerned i called them i said this and this and this, I'm not going to do. Uh, and also, it helps get as we get older because we're in a status. <laughs> <laughs> this and this and this, I'm not going to do. I choose to do this and this and this. And I'm and Kalogman and the public figure. So I have to address others. But even that was a lot. Uh, I had to begin to even cut down and keep it within a, a manageable portion. But my children don't think I'm doing it uh, the right. They feel, they can see now the, the stress I'm under. I think as they are older, they, are, they can actually see the pressures that you, you put yourselves under. But I think ultimately it's just having the courage to say no. Yeah. Really. Otherwise, you're going to collapse. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And also, think of the, look at the things that are most important to you so that uh, you don't throw away what is most important to you. 
and your children. And I just have to say this because I think some of you are still childbearing and you have young children. Whatever you do, put your children first. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, if I were to live my life again, that is one area I would revisit and do differently. They, you will never, you will not be reminded for the number of meetings you attended. Those children have been given by God to you and no one else. And it is your biggest responsibility and honor to look after their lives, to nurture them, and to make sure that you do your best. When you do that, you will be at peace with yourself. They may not turn out to be great, by the way. <laughs> but still, do it. <laughs> and of course, that pertinent question hasn't been answered. Uh, you know, uh, I... I guess in that way, maybe I'm a, I'm a typical woman that uh, you don't uh, throw your hats in the ring or you don't raise your hand. Uh, the, 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 yeah, ne? <laughs> <laughs> the ecosystem picks you up. It's not a job that I would like to do and I long to do because I feel that there's so many other things to do. And secondly, I feel there's so many of you who are much younger and more dynamic than Ukoko Fananam. <laughs> but that being said, if we were ever to find ourselves in a situation where I had no other choice, I probably would submit. So, you know, I'm just watching what, uh, what, 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 what is happening. But none can forget. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've concluded our Q&A. Yes, you can. Uh, yeah. Thanks, um, ladies, um, for those, uh, for that beautiful engagement. Um, it, it absolutely warms my heart when not only I have a privilege of engaging with Umam Pumzile, but through the, the questions that you guys have asked, and it's, it's so rich and it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity. And so I have thoroughly enjoyed the Q&A. Yeah. And to Usisi Oi accountant, a chartered. I'm also chartered. <laughs> I'm also chartered, by the way. <laughs> but thank you for asking that question, because when, I, when everybody knew I was going to have a session with Umam Pumzile, everybody said, ask her if she's going to. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going to ask her that. This is about women. <laughs> so thank you <laughs> for asking the, 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 the question. Um, Pumsle, you it has been beyond um, what I would have expected. I knew this was going to be amazing. I, 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 who, who said she's a fan? She just wanted to touch Mom yes. I also, I I also someone said to me yesterday, Oh, the chartered one, yes. Um, yesterday, someone said, oh, you, you're you having a thing with Umam Pumzil. I said, oh my gosh, I'm such a fan. I hope I'm not just going to be like, you know, <laughs> starstruck. Um, so she is my aunt. I see her at family functions. Um, but every time I'm just like, oh, wow. It is always such a privilege to be in your company. And um, one thing I, 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 I observed about Mom Pumsley when we were sitting in the, in the holding room, she was, she's very soft-spoken. Now, I think didn't we be so even when I try to, you know, <laughs> I, it doesn't. <laughs> I always try, but it doesn't really work out well for me. But, um, the Anpumzile, the, and you'll attest to this, Jackie, the Anpumzile that we were sitting with having tea was a lot more mm. 
But I think when she speaks about the things that she's passionate about, yeah. wow. Yeah. Then you see Ukuti. Yeah. I think when we were having tea there, you would have thought, ah, this old lady, uh, yeah. maybe even when she was minister, she was, eh. but now you can see that she knows when she's got power and how to use yeah. it effectively to achieve what she wants to achieve. Yeah. So I've actually enjoyed the two versions of you that I've seen <laughs> in just the past couple of hours because I was sitting there having tea saying, hey, is it suited us all loud? Because mom pumps in the way I move about, so now we can. Um, but it has been an absolute, absolute, absolute pleasure. This is a memory that I will absolutely treasure forever. Um, once again, I would like to thank Bidvest. Um, in particular, as Ulsis Cheki alluded to, I mean, this partnership of ours is, is very young, but I mean, wow, it, mm. it, 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 it's, it's, it's yielded um, um, such fruits. And, and as we were uh, uh, explaining to Umama, the Bidvest company itself and what they've managed to achieve in terms of women empowerment and diversity and inclusion in such a short space of time is so amazing. So it's not just about a partnership with a corporate for the sake of a partnership with a corporate. It's a corporate that that is absolutely doing the most amazing things in this country and walking the talk. And so you may be proud to be associated with the BMF, but we are very, very proud to be associated with the best. So to my auntie, thank you very much. We've been talking about this Noman Pums lessons like February or March. It's been a long time. I keep checking, auntie. Are you still available on this day? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Aunt Pumslet, for the stay. Um, I, I, I don't want to repeat myself. Um, it's been an absolute honor. You have shared your heart. I think those of you who only see you on TV and on UN Women and Deputy President today have gotten, you know, just to, as they say, just to touch <laughs> and to feel the power yeah. the, the, with that grace and that and that soft spokenness and and that motherliness but that that fire mm -hmm. that has made you as successful as you have been and impactful as you have been in everything that you have touched so thank you very very much Debulela. yeah on your feet come on Wow, well, we, yes, a standing ovation indeed. Is my mic on, Neville? Yeah. <laughs> what an incredible, incredible conversation. Wow. Oh, wow. Whoever didn't make it to this event and had subscribed and said they paid their ticket and they said they were going to come and they missed out, they certainly have lost out on such an impactful, impactful evening. Thank you so much. All right, we are about to close off, but before we do, I'd like to have closing remarks from Maloti Matovi. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, our honorable guest of honor, Mampum Delengulka, the national deputy president of the BMF, Eseti Mangwakyo, Jackie Kumalo, our proud sponsor from Bidvest, Menti Macapella, Provincial Chairperson of the Eastern Cape, our Western Cape Provincial Chairperson, Mr. Lois Ngwemla, members of the Profcom and Menkos present, our valued BMF members, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Maloti Mutobi, and I'm holding the fort as Chairperson of the Cape Town branch. I feel honored to propose this vote of thanks on behalf of the BMF Western Cape. Again, wow. Yeah. Can we give our panelists another round of applause, please? As I reflect on this evening's deliberations, there's a few things that resonated. Jackie highlighted the importance of corporate South Africa in driving diversity in leadership positions, which is clearly what Bidvest has pioneered. SA2, in the video that was presented earlier, spoke of dismantling this only woman phenomenon. 
which I must agree is tired. And of course, of the pearls of wisdom drawn from Umama, included as challenging the societal norms that are instilled in our moral fiber, I ask, who are the change agents? And I think the answers lie in each one of us. And of course, by having strategic alliance with our male counterparts, that for me is the essence of being a true feminist that Umam Pumzile alluded to. Ours as the BMF is to ignite conversations much like what we had this evening as we drive the socioeconomic transformation agenda that has the true and just emancipation of women leaders at its forefront. A special thank you to Jakey and our corporate sponsor, Bitvest, for advocating for such platforms. A big thank you once again to Mama Opumzile for providing, for providing so much value to our audience. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for the Deputy President, who continues to lead us with so much grace and selflessness. Thank you to everyone who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes and made sure that this event is the success that it is. And last, but by no means least, we are grateful to all of you for your presence this evening. As we close, I want to leave you with a quote from the current and first female president of Ethiopia, President Saleh Work Zude, open quote. If the history of Africa was written by Africans and by women, I think we would find many unsung heroes, close quote. It again makes me proud that many of those women would be found in this very room this evening. Kialeboha, Ingosi, thank you. Thank you very much, Maloti, for those impactful words. Uh, and indeed, we are the change agents in this room. And I think if anything that you leave us today, uh, what there's, there's the note on a true feminist speaks up against anything that is unjust and stands up for those that are less powerful or whose rights are being diminished. All right, doesn't matter if it's a female, a male, a child, whatever it is, you are all true feminists in this room. It is your job, it is your role, it is your duty to stand up for those that are less privileged. We are so excited to see what the rest of uh, the BMF has in store for the rest of the year and uh, DP's uh, leadership, especially the women chapter. It's really incredible to see the work that you've accomplished over the last couple of months. Um, and thank you to each one of you. Uh, I think we're all leaving this room with our cups really, really full, and I'm hoping that you're going to take the time to pour out into the next woman. And if you're a gent, you're going to pour out into the next gent that you encounter, uh, because uh, together we do so much better. And when we hold each other accountable, we certainly will do so much better as a country as well.